everyone, and welcome to the 3.30 session of the 2020 Open Simulator Community Conference. In this session, we are happy to introduce a session called the Creativity Panel. Our hostess is Maria Korolov, and she is joined by her fellow panelists, Lisa Laxton and Mike Laurie. Maria Korolov is a published author and covers artificial intelligence for CIO Magazine and cybersecurity for CSO Online. She's also the editor of Hypergrid Business since 2009. During her 20 years as a journalist, she's run a business news bureau in Shanghai, covered wars in the former Soviet Union, and wrote about local politics for the Chicago Tribune. Lisa Laxton is the research and development visionary and CEO of Open Simulator Community focused foundation called Infinite Metaverse Alliance, IMA. She is also the president of Laxton Consulting LLC with experience in providing various virtual world technology solutions for education, research, business, and defense con clients. Mike Laurie is a versatile entrepreneur with extensive virtual world, virtual finance, management, and IT experience. He built one of the top 25 virtual reality development companies in Second Life in 2006 with less than $200 in startup capital, reaching a quarter million dollars in annual revenues in less than a year and providing the first virtual stock exchanges. Please check out the website located at conference.opensimulator.org for speaker bios, details of the sessions, and the full schedule of events. Now this session is being streamed, live streamed and recorded. So if you have questions or comments during the session, you may send tweets to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag OSCC20. And welcome everyone. Let's begin the session. Thank you for that introduction. Hi everybody, this is me again. For those of you who are here for the panel earlier today about the hypergrid. Today we're gonna to talk about creativity in OpenSim. And we've got two very highly creative people here on the stage with me today. Uh, now, OpenSim is a great place for creativity. Uh, the land costs are low or free, and hypergrid travel means that you can have a home-based region that you can build on to your heart's content and invite people from all over the universe to come and visit it, which is really, really cool and fantastic for creators. And there are also lots of grids that are out there that focus on creativity and the arts and, and, and everything else. Uh, before we get to all that, we're gonna be discussing these topics later on. Uh, first, I wanna ask uh, Lisa Laxton to talk a little bit about her work um, uh, for, uh, as, a, as a consultant and her work for the Infinite Metaverse Alliance. Um, and she works with education, business, research and defense clients and building projects. And um, uh, so she's interested in uh, collaborating to advance virtual world technology and improve accessibility. And her latest project is the Magnolia Gardens of Knowledge. So Lisa, can you talk to us about what you're working on these days? Sure, uh, thank you, Maria. And, and thank you, Lear and Mike and everyone here at the conference. I see Terrence out in the audience. Welcome to OpenSim. Um, I hope everybody is staying safe and healthy. First, what is Magnolia Gardens of Knowledge? Let me talk about that. My mother, one of the original founders of IMA who loves to garden, had a vision where users would be able to learn about plants and flowers in a virtual world. This inspired me to design Magnolia Gardens of Knowledge and it is dedicated to her. But I took the design quite a bit further so that not only could users do that, but could also learn to use the viewer if they are a new user to interact with digital teaching assistants that I call DITAs. These are NPCs uh, when an educator is not available uh, and experience a live interactive virtual garden with task oriented attendant NPCs. And I'll talk more about that. I wanted to find a creative way to provide a demonstration of how educators could use virtual worlds to teach non-virtual world skills in just about any topic. 
So I propose to design to some of the IMA community as an IMA community project and for some help. To accomplish this, we decided to use new avatars for the MPCs and the open source Satter Farm project. We had many flowers and plants to make, so it became a team effort uh, where others helped build the objects. Uh, you'll see uh, some of the images from Magnolia Gardens on the screen behind me. And we also needed to create the gardenscape and the new avatars that we would be using. So I want to give great thanks and a shout out to Rosa, Alex, Eve, Timberwolf, and Joe Quirion for their help on this project. Uh, what makes this project different from other gardens that you can find in OpenSim? Yeah, that's a good question. What makes it unique? Um, that's, I've got a long answer for that, so bear with me. <laughs> this is a demonstration of using OpenSim affordances or DITAs to provide introductory learning about any topic with concrete, visible parts. It introduces the parts here, garden plants, showing 3D images of them in a typical location, which is situated learning. The garden shows a virtual place can be set up to introduce the subject. Almost any course of instruction begins with at least one unit about the parts. The learner should be able to name any instance of an important part and should be able to find instances of a part when given the name. If the part has normal locations, the learner should initially seek instances there, but the locations could change, and we did that intentionally. The four DITAs interactively teach users about the basics of using the SceneGate Viewer, which is an IMA project, and to interact with the virtual world while learning real-world processes associated with harvested garden items as an example use case. These were developed using first-generation adaptive AI. Each user experience is different because they have many paths of learning that they can follow when they interact with the DITAs. Adaptive AI is more than just a chatbot, but it has a limit of permutations based on the number of choices that the users have. This is well suited for self-paced learning which was behind the design. The next generation research will integrate DITAs with an external AMO server. Uh, for those who don't know what that is, that's artificial intelligence markup language uh, to add intelligence to the DITAs. So DITA 1 right now teaches the basics of navigation and camera zoom. DITA 2 teaches sitting, uh, working with your AO, how to use your sound controls and your camera tools. DITA 3 teaches advanced object interaction with a real-world process simulation. And DITA 4 teaches the user how to get and attach a wearable rod to go fishing from inventory and to use voice. So we had a fun time when the Virtual World MOOC folks came to visit last year. I believe we had one user who found out she lost her fish because she was too far away from the fish bucket when she caught it. <laughs> <laughs> now, more DITAs are planned for advanced social skills. Uh, new users need to learn, like buying and wearing clothes, using a HUD, driving vehicles, and dancing. These are things that most of us really take for granted because we've been in virtual world for quite some time. Now, you mentioned that you also simulate some real-world processes uh, in this garden. Are they, are they biological processes or, or more? And are they interactive with the people who come and visit? Well, first we have to talk about the interactivity, uh, and then we can talk about the process. There are five task-oriented NPCs. Uh, you may recognize some of these from the Set of Farm project in terms of what they do, even though we made new NPCs for that purpose. What's different about them uh, versus the regular Set of Farm NPCs is each of these have their own specialty. 
their custom program to tend the garden objects in different ways, and this has been adapted from that project. R2-D2 tends to crops. Azalea tends to flowers and plants. Anemone tends to the animals. Antonio tends to the trees. And Armin is learning to tend to the grounds. The items chosen by the NPCs to plant and harvest are randomized. The planted items are not identified in text like they are with the standard set of farm items. This forces the learner to learn about the plants near the entrance that are linked to authoritative web pages from the National Gardening Association. Learners can do the same things the attendant NPCs can do if they're not wearing a group tag because the garden does not belong to a group, unlike the standard set of farms. So users or learners can learn from the NPCs and by doing. And the, so this is about the real world uh, simulations, not right. just the things right. you learn about open sim, but about actual world stuff. Right. Now, we take that a step further into an actual process simulation. Mm. Uh, the user enters the Magnolia Gardens in a cave with buildings on each side. Now, one side of the building has what I call advanced tools. These interactive objects emulate items like a sun jar, cooktop, juice press, a dehydrator, a fine grinder, an infuser, cold storage, dry storage, and of course water sources. Some of these items don't exist in the Satter Farm Project uh, objects. So we created those and then provided the scripting behind them. On the wall, there's a map of these tools along with a tutorial and a process flowchart. So learners can follow the written tutorial to learn to make apple cider, or they can interact with DITA3 to learn about and how to make essential oils. Uh, and this is based on real world information. So not all the ingredients needed for the different recipes are, are contained in the cold and dry storage. To get some ingredients, you need to learn to make them by following the extraction processes. So a new user is actually engaged in a, a real-world simulation, but they are also learning to work with the objects interactively. Uh, with this type of self-paced learning, users gain knowledge and skills for both virtual and non-virtual worlds. So some learning principles include social learning, situation le situated learning, spatial memory, concept maps, and roadmaps. It's likely we will spin off similar projects for other topics, including role play. So this is a work in progress. All right. Now, if people want to visit, the hypergood ad address is up on the screen, and I'm going to post it in text chat below. Um, are there any other places that people can go to to find uh, the, this work that you're working on? Uh, well, the, to visit Magnolia Gardens, uh, right now, we have uh, the fully interactive NPC sim is over in a development region uh, that is accessible. Uh, but if they visit uh, the Magnolia Gardens that's contained in IMA Outpost Alpha, they can interact with all of the DITAs, and that gives them a really a good start. Uh, they can also interact with the garden plants. Uh, but the NPCs that are attending the garden are not active right now. They will be very soon. Oh, very cool. We'll be updating that um, after we finish a little bit more testing of some customizing that I've been doing. Now, there is a video of the full interaction here at this link that I posted in chat. Uh, that is part of our playlist from the IMA YouTube channel. And uh, Selby also has a blog article he wrote uh, after the Virtual World MOOC visit uh, last year. And you'll see a link to that article in chat as well. Mm -hmm. Now, I would love to have more visitors, get more feedback, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, and consider new topics. All right, please, if anybody has any questions, you can put them in local text chat, and we can get around um, probably after we finish uh, the introduction. Did you see um, the, the quest? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were wanting them. They'll go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Lisa, somebody's asking you for contact information, and she's already posted it in the local chat. 
So that was pretty fast. Uh, so uh, I want to introduce uh, my I, four. I, yes? Maria, just a minute. I know I missed some questions. Uh, I, I can see the last one, something about business processes. Um, I'm open to ideas, so contact me because I, I have a bunch of them on my top of my head. Go ahead. All right. So uh, here we have uh, this this robot, half robot, uh, sitting sitting on the blue couch is Mike Lorry. Um, he is the CEO of Galactic Systems, which is a software development company focusing on VR, AR, and blockchain technologies. And some of you might know him from Second Life, where he built one of the top 25 virtual reality development companies with a quarter million dollars in annual, annual revenues in less than a year, 53 regions full of paying customers. He's also be behind the first virtual stock exchanges and helped capitalize dozens of other virtual businesses. But today he's going to talk about some of his projects in OpenSim, and he has a lot of projects going on. He teaches a Blender class every Sunday about how to use Blender, which is a 3D, uh, free 3D modeling program. He also chairs the exhibits committee of the International Space Flight Museum, and he's helping build a new Star Wars role-playing community, which all sound super interesting. And uh, let's start with the most useful one, the Blender classes. Um, can you talk about uh, Blender and why it's important to creators in open sim and, and how how you got into all this um well i got in i i joined kitely in 2016 after a number of years away from open sim uh, just because i wanted to create scenery for uh, the cover of a novel I had written, and I discovered that um, there wasn't content available to create the scene, so I had to make it, and, and using the in-world building tools wasn't to the fidelity I wanted, so I had to learn how to use Blender. So um, there, at the time, there was a, a, a group, a Blender uh, teaching group, um, and uh, I learned Blender with, with them, uh, um, and eventually I wound up taking over that group and you know it's it's really essential to know uh, some type of uh, modeling application uh, to build efficient uh, builds for for OpenSim. You know, one of the problems in Second Life and OpenSim is that uh, most of the lag comes from the inefficiencies of uh, the builds. Uh, the the in-world building tools are great for people to learn to build. But as meshes, they're extremely inefficient and they, they cause a lot of uh, computational burden on the, the computer and the server that is the main source of lag other than you know, other you know, communications-based sources that we, we deal with. Um, and so you know, that was why eventually Linden Lab uh, uh, enabled people to create mesh uh, in, in, in for Second Life, and now in we can do it in OpenSim. Is that a mesh is far more efficient? You can render the same shape for you know 10 to 20 percent of the number of vertices and triangles that you can render the same object built with prims, and because of that, you can you can have a lot more detail in the things you build if you make it with mesh and you can have more stuff in the same land area. So um, it, it, it reduces lag for everybody. Uh, and at the same time, it uh, increases uh, standard, you know, frame rate performance for people. So you don't need uh, a, a super high end computer as much now as you used to be uh, in Second Life, you know, just trying to go on the mainland uh, in, in Second Life used to be uh, terrible with the amount of lag if you didn't have a top end machine. Um, so uh, every Sunday, 6 p.m. in the Space Force region in uh, Kitely, uh, we sit down and uh, we do uh, screen sharing on a media, media on a prim and I'm show step by step through different uh, steps of, of processes of using Blender for different functions to create mesh for uh, OpenSim. That's really cool. I get a lot of people coming to these classes. We it varies from week to week. We range <laughs> from, you know, between two to sometimes as many as a half dozen. Um, you know, getting the word out more is 
is uh, important. Um, and I'm not the only person who teaches there. Occasionally we get kayaker coming in to, to talk about a, a given topic. You know, one of the, we, we, we teach everything from the basic intro to using Blender up to much more advanced things like uh, you know, rigging, um, mesh for, for avatar shapes and clothing and so forth, uh, which is a very advanced topic that's particularly given issues with uh, the various uh, plugins for, for creating rigged mesh. Um, we've been helping to reverse engineer that process to make it easier so that you people can make rigged mesh without buying the Avastar plugin. Uh, so they can, they'll be able to do rigged mesh completely with the, just the free uh, Blender application. Uh, now, the announcements are posted on the Kitely calendar. So yes, people can find out what uh, events are happening and what the schedule is. Yep. All right. And I've posted a link, a link to uh, one of those uh, announcements. Um, in the chat here. So if, if people don't know how to find Kitely announcements, um, they can they can just click uh, on that. I, I'm sorry. Yes, it was 4 p.m. Um, the 6 p.m. is another meeting. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the the other thing is is uh, we mentioned the International Space Flight Museum, and that's what I, we have a 6 p.m. meeting on Sundays in in Kitely for that. And so um, we build. Uh, spacecraft rockets, uh, all sorts of exhibits to document and, and educate people about the entire history of human spaceflight, not just from the U.S., but from all countries. And um, so it's a real educational resource, not just for OpenSim, but for people bringing, you know, different uh, schools into, uh, school classes into OpenSim, particularly in the current uh, era. Um, it's a great educational resource for, for, for school kids. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we need to do is we just expanded uh, what we have from two uh, regions that were, I believe, two by two in size, each one, and we've expanded to an eight by eight mega region. And so we're doing a big expansion in our exhibits. We have uh, the normal rocket exhibit sim, and then we have a Mars colony exhibit that we've been working on recently. And we're gonna be expanding to have a lunar uh, colony exhibit and Europa and Titan and, and, and uh, uh, some other locations around the solar system. And so uh, one of the things we've been implementing is a, a bidding process so that when we have a need for exhibits, we can put up a request for proposals to the public and so that anybody can submit a bid to build an exhibit for us uh, and they can specify how much they need to be paid for it and we you know select the winner based upon you know what they're offering to build and, and for how much. And so anybody that's interested in participating in these com this competitive bidding process can attend our, our Sunday 6 p.m. Um, ISM meetings in Kitely in the uh, ISM sandbox region um, any Sunday. So this Sunday, next Sunday, et cetera, and sign up. And so you'll get notices uh, when we have uh, RFPs going out and you can uh, bid for, the, for this on a, on a paying basis. Thank you. I just posted a link to to that as well, as well as to the Kitely calendar, uh, so people can see both of those events are listed on the Kitely calendar. Great. Um, uh, yeah. So um, now you also talked uh, to me about you're working on role playing projects, uh, and can you talk about uh, what you're doing to bring role playing groups into open set? Uh, well, I've, I'm a big Star Wars nut and, and sci-fi nut, as you can probably tell from my avatar. Um, uh, I used to do uh, Star Wars role play in Second Life, and uh, since coming to OpenSim, given the uh, much more affordability of, of working in OpenSim than Second Life, I've you know it's it's I've it's I've wondered why we don't get more people uh, and groups migrating from Second Life to OpenSim because most of the role playing groups content is built by the players themselves and they should be able to port it pretty easily. Um, so 
this is starting to happen. Uh, we're seeing, for instance, there's a, been a, a large migration recently of pirate uh, combat groups from Second Life coming into Open Sim. Um, they're particularly with the advent of the mega regions in Kitely, they're seeing a lot uh, joining uh, Kitely there because of the large size and, and the smooth operations of of Kitely regions. Um, and so I run a sim called Naboo, which is uh, modeled on uh, the planet in uh, episode one of, of Star Wars. And so we, I built a full scale model of Gunga City, where Jar Jar Binks and his people are from. And so we've been, you know, slowly building uh, up Naboo over time. And there's uh, another uh, sim owner is uh, starting. He's got a couple regions of his own that he's been opening up. And so we're hoping to encourage more people who are interested in various uh, role playing to get together to, you know, try to organize. You know, part of role playing aside from creating the content is building the community and so you need to have you know the groups together it can't just be the the creator sitting down creating the stuff uh, you need to have people who uh, you know want to role play with it and getting people involved in that and so you know given the current conditions it seems like you know a lot of us have a lot more free time on our hands now <laughs> indoors than we used to and so it seems like a great time where role playing is something that can really help us occupy our time and, and while you know, maintaining social connections and so forth so um, i invite people to to join us if you're interested in science fiction role play to join with us there's the pirates groups um and if there's other role playing groups we'd love to hear from you and try to build a, a broader uh, role playing community in in open sim uh, now, for people who don't know, I want to explain a little bit about Mega Worlds. Um, this is Kitely's answer to variable-sized regions. A lot of grids offer a similar similar packages. Um, Kitely's has some interesting performance enhancements. So you get for 100 bucks a month, you get 64 regions, which is less than two dollars a region. You get 150,000 crims, uh, and you have uh, up to 80 avatars. Um, on this land area, which is all, I mean, it's all like basically it acts as one big giant region that's eight by eight. So that's that's really new. Kitely just rolled that out this fall. Um, so uh, now Kitely isn't the only grid where stuff is happening. Um, so I want to talk to both of you about what you're seeing um, on uh, the open sim grids. Uh, we have Franco Grid and Craft and OS Grid are, are well known for for museums and art exhibits and um, uh, and, and uh, other sort of events. Um, and we have low cost uh, things that people run on their own uh, servers or uh, self hosted regions that they attach to OS Grid for free, and uh, as well as niche private grids. Um, so, so Lisa, can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing, uh, and especially, I know you wanted to say something about niche, private niche grids. Uh, sure. Uh, the one thing I, I have to say is I can't recommend any one place to go visit because right. there is so much creativity out there, <laughs> and, and uh, I, I don't want to say that, oh, this is the grid that does art and this is the grid that does music and so on and so forth, because there are individual creators in, that have regions and parcels that have done some amazing things that you wouldn't even know to find on those grids. Uh, so the, the key here is that most of the grids... Uh, out on the hypergrid are niche grids. They they do have themes that go along with them. Uh, they're not trying to be the next Philip Linden, you know, the next Second Life or whatever, because that has been tried and it failed. Because this is a decentralized protocol, and that makes it really good for niche grids. Uh, you know, but from a home-based grid perspective, there are some trade-offs from a community perspective. Uh, but the community, I believe, needs to come together and find some solutions uh, to those uh, negatives that we do see 
uh, where you may have a non-technical person administering a grid and they, um, you know, create some issues that might impact the hypergrid uh, protocols uh, in terms of the way they may modify their databases, etc. Uh, we do need to find some trade-off uh, solutions. Uh, now, uh, if you're looking to find events that are happening, such as music events or art events, uh, one of the most popular places, OpenSimWorld.com. I've posted a link to their events calendar. And they also have directories of regions organized by category, such as, for example, uh, art. Uh, and I posted the link to the, uh, their art category. Uh, and there's a few other directories and uh, lots of Facebook groups. Uh, Google Plus used to be the place, but you know that's been shut down. So now there are several uh, Facebook groups. If you search for Open Sim, they will come up. And there's a lot of a lot of events uh, happening throughout that you can look for. Uh, Mike, would you like to add anything about what you're seeing? Well, uh, from a role play perspective, there's another big role play community uh, that are, are Star Trek role players on uh, the Third Rock grid. Uh, which is a, a nice, uh, I would say it's uh, a small to midland grid, very, uh, very uh, user oriented and uh, the kind of science fiction -y, uh, uh, orientation in a lot of its content. Uh, good people run that, so I can recommend that. Um, uh, for in terms of event notifications, there used to be a service called Hype Events, which basically that still exists. It's, it, they still exist. Oh, yeah. Their, yeah. their boards seem to stop working, but they're great because they aggregate the event uh, postings of a lot of different grids. So it's easy to to have those all put together without. You know, one of the, uh, I love the There's Open just Sim a World post site. Now you, yeah, you probably I, just need the new link. Okay, that's great. Great to hear. Um, you know, the Open Sim Grid site uh, is is a great place. The one thing I, I that annoys me about that is I have to keep renew going in and renewing uh my uh, my events every week and and yeah. they you know so it's and yeah. there's, there's no, also there's, there's no repeat posting that's yeah. that's annoying um so you know if they could do something where they it would be easier to have repeat uh events without having to redo that all the time you know probably it would be a, a big help i think but uh so yeah, yeah. Event just, promotion is a big topic uh, that, you know, I think as a community, we might be able to come up with a little bit better solution than what's out there now. Mm -hmm. uh, so I posted the link to Third Rock Grid uh, in chat, and I also posted the new link to the Hype Events uh, calendar. Uh, so you can subscribe to that as well. On, on Third Rock Grid, just one other note, the, the Star Trek group, which is uh, United Federation Starfleet is also associated with the Second Life group. Uh, okay, so um, uh, the, now there's also uh, qu quite a few niche grids like uh, Nara's Nook for for writers. There's a science fiction themed grid. There's a new vampire grid that just uh, popped up. Um, and uh, if you have uh, an event uh, that you'd like to promote or, or anything like that, in addition to posting in directories I listed, you can also get a free ad in Hypergood Business. Um, here, if you want to write up your event or promote an event that's coming up, you can submit an article. All this is free. Please, uh, you're welcome to do that. I'm going to post my email in chat so that we can do that. Um, and... Um, uh, and there's also the Hyperica directory, which is now owned by Fred Beckinson, um, that also has a, an in-world uh, system that works with the viewers as well. Uh, so uh, one of the things that comes up when creators talk about OpenSim is the question of content protection. Uh, there's uh, a, f a feeling, uh, I th especially I think it was especially strong maybe 10 years ago, that people weren't safe. Uh, that the content wasn't safe in OpenSim. And um, can you guys talk about that? Uh, Lisa? Uh, yeah, I mean, 
for me, this is a really complex topic, and it really needs its own panel session. So um, I had it in my mind after some discussion with quite a few people uh, before the conference that we really need to host a panel on that, and I'm open to anyone who would like to talk to me about their ideas on how we might want to put that panel together. Uh, we really do need to start looking at that from a developer's perspective what we can do uh, to help assure merchants uh, that their content is not as um, susceptible as they believe. Mike? Um, it, I find it interesting when you know people in Second Life uh, denigrate OpenSim and claim that everybody here are a bunch of copy botters. And outside of one particular grid I won't name, I haven't met any other copy botters in OpenSim. Uh, but I find it interesting that it's it, they cl claim that everything here has been stolen from Second Life. Well, if Second Life wasn't so insecure, uh, then nothing here would be stolen. And so really, if we're going to keep OpenSim uh, connected in any way technologically with the Second Life platform, um, the onus really is on Linden Lab to make their grid more secure for content creators. Um, and, and if, you know, otherwise the people of OpenSim really should have a conversation and, and make a decision about whether to, to stay technologically uh, connected to Second Life uh, in their platform or to go off and, and to modify the OpenSim code base to make it more secure. And by doing so, uh, this would make OpenSim a, a greater value proposition to people than Second Life is. And, and it would attract more people to come here than to, to stay in Second Life. Right. Right. Now, people say that because you can give yourself God powers in OpenSim or teleport to a grid that has God powers in OpenSim, that it's easy to steal content here. I, I, but I, I want to set the record straight since I'm on the stage. Uh, you, you can copy bot anything in Second Life as easily as you can in OpenSim. And like, like Mike said, most of the stolen content is stolen in Op Second Life. That's where the content is. The only difference, the only extra thing you can do in OpenSim is scripts. If you have high-end scripted content, um, then God Powers can give you access to that. So if you have, if you're a creator with very high-end scripted content, uh, a type of good business, I recommend that you can uh, stick to grids that either are close to the hypergrid or restrict travel in the hypergrid to content, like Kitely does. They filter content that's not allowed to travel if the creator doesn't want to allow it to travel, and several other grids do the same thing. Um, or you can move the script server side. So the script isn't on the object itself, but it runs like somewhere else on your own servers so that the secret sauce of your application isn't accessible in the world. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and this is where, you know, my comments from my previous uh, panel uh, really tie in here is that utilizing uh, encryption technologies like those used in blockchain is really essential mm -hmm. to, to helping to secure uh, the assets of the creators in OpenSim. Because Ditto. with 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 smart contracts on a blockchain, you can build into smart contracts the heuristics that will ensure that uh, if someone, you know, if you know, let's say I have a, a car and I put it on a smart contract on the blockchain and people buy it and someone reses it and they use a ripping app to to copy bot the car. And then they try to turn around and they try to sell it as their own. Well, they've got to sell it through a smart contract on the same blockchain and the blockchain sees their upload and it compares the mesh pattern. It can compare the textures. And so it can do a heuristic comparison of how the consanguinity of the two pieces of content and say, okay, this is 50% or 80% or 90% identical to this other con contract. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you, you know, so you want to decline the upload or pay that contract a royalty? 
And so that way you can create this chain of royalties and enforce it through the, the heuristics of the, the smart contract system. And that protects creators' rights because it ensures that even if you try to bypass the whole blockchain by ripping and re-uploading, the heuristics of the smart contract system catch that and enforce a royalty system. And uh, the other thing that I want to add is that nothing gets rid of stolen content faster than good, inexpensive, legitimate content. We saw that happen with music and with videos because we have Spotify, we have Netflix, and the amount of illegal downloads, they're, so, they're such a pain, they're hard to find, they're riddled with viruses. It's everybody has Netflix, everybody has Spotify. Similarly, in OpenSim, we have a lot of creators who are who are selling and giving away original legally licensed content. And we have the Kitely market. So today I needed a pair of glasses. And instead of hunting around the hypergrid for it, it, took me a couple of seconds to go to Kitely, a few cents to buy it, and I have my glasses that you can see me wearing right now. And that is just I think that's just awesome that OpenSim now has that because it's so, so valuable. Right. Um, but there's one more thing I wanted to ask you guys before we go, and that's about OpenSim graphics and, um, and OpenSim technology. Uh, does, does to, to me as a user, it, has, it doesn't seem to have changed that much over the past 10 years. We do have Mesh now. But other than that, I'm not seeing a lot of differences in the way that OpenSim looks now than it did 10 years ago. Is this a handicap to creativity or does this help creativity? Uh, Lisa, what do you think? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. Um, from a technical perspective, obviously, we need to update the viewers to support industry standard formats like GLTF and X3D. Uh, creators can also include AI-powered chatbots as part of their creative project. And, and that can help us get up to speed with uh, user expectations from a video game community perspective. You know, that's what they're used to seeing. So we need to do something about quality. Uh, when you think about that quality of graphics, you look at it from a user's perspective. And Frank and I had a conversation about this in our meeting this past week. Uh, there was a study that he mentioned where users will accept and engage on platforms that either have low quality graphics or they have high quality graphics equally. They accept those as bad or good, and then they focus on the features of what they can do in the virtual world. Second Life and Open Sim suffer from being in between. <laughs> so, so in my opinion, we can greatly improve the graphics and the user experience in Open Simulator, much of what we're working on at IMA are stepping stones toward that goal. Uh, we want to make it more attractive to millennial users. We need developers of tomorrow so that developers of today have someone to pass the torch to so the platform is sustainable and we can grow that community of users. This in turn helps all of us uh, attain our objectives, whether it's education, commerce, medical benefit, or socialization. So that's my two cents. <laughs> like? Um. Well, there's kind of two sides to that. Number one is is complexity, okay? Um, people tend to put too much detail into the mesh when it doesn't need to be there. Um, the first mesh I uploaded in Kitely when I first joined was a bong, and I was so uh, impressed that I could upload a bong with 250,000 triangles in it, and I thought that was awesome but it crashed my viewer because it was so <laughs> complex, okay? And and people tend to, you know, and, and like Green was mentioning in the, in the comments that a lot of people just download junk off of uh, free content download sites, but the problem is, is those meshes are very, very complex and people just download it from the sites and they upload it to OpenSim and they upload it to Second Life and it's highly complex and it completely defeats the purpose of having mesh in OpenSim and Second Life, which is to make it more efficient so that there's less lag on the server and less lag on the viewer. And so we really need creators to be a lot more efficient about their mesh. So you can take a, you know, 
quarter million dollar quarter million vertex uh, mesh you download off of some free site and with a few simple uh, tricks you can learn in my class so come on and attend <laughs> um, you can make that a much more efficient mesh that's maybe 20 to 10 percent of the total number of vertexes and triangles that are in whatever you downloaded and, and that makes it, it yeah, much and more efficient. My in the process of uh, really optimizing their model and simplifying it uh, so that it's a efficient triangle uh, rendering, they also have the opportunity to fix all those flip faces and those holes in the mesh that are <laughs> just prevalent in yeah. a lot of things that you get off of, you know, some of these 3D modeling sites. Yeah. Now, another side to it is in the texture rendering, okay? Uh, now, in the old days, we had just one texture you could apply to each face of a prim, um, and that was it. And then you could, you know, add a little shiny to it, and you could add a little um, bump map to it and so forth, but there wasn't any other textures you could apply. Well, now we can have apply three textures. We can have the diffuse, which is the normal colored texture, of the, of the surface, then we can have a normal, which is the bump map, and you can make a, 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 a custom normal map uh, image for uh, the bump map of a, an object. And then we have what's called the, the specular, uh, which is essentially deals with the shininess and the environmental uh, reflections of the, the object. Um, so you can have three different, and, and, and using multiple textures together like that is what we call in graphics, physics-based rendering. And you can have complex textures for every feature of a, a rendered texture, whether it's the glow, whether it's the transparency, et cetera, et cetera. And we only use in OpenSim three of those types of textures, and we could have more. And the more of those you use, the more physically realistic the world will look like, okay? Um, and secondly, um, there's another issue with the the rendering engine in the browse in, in the viewer um, uses a, a color management system that is 30 years out of date. And this is something that that I tell people that in Blender is that um, the color management that we are seeing on the screen here was de designed for using on cathode ray tubes. It was not designed for use with LCD screens. And so because of that, our, the, the range, the, what's called the gamut of colors that we can see here is very narrow. All right. And now if we went from a what's called sRGB color management model to what's called a filmic management model, we could just that one change would make this whole scene look a lot more photorealistic. And that's something I encourage anybody in the audience that's on the uh, uh, OS viewer dev teams to look to try to work to change the color management model used by the viewers, because that one change will drastically change how great OpenSim looks. Mm. Well, I'm, we're going to have to uh, end that on this note, which is very disappointing to me because I'd love to get into the discussion of VR and what OpenSim can do in that because I always, I always want to get that into that discussion. Um, but uh, we don't. So um, like I said, uh, the, you can email me. Uh, e e Lisa has also uh, posted her email in chat if you have uh, questions for us. Uh, and the slides are available online. Thank you. And, and for those that have more interest in uh, Seengate viewer development, uh, we'll be talking about that tomorrow morning. So be sure to attend that session. All right. Thank Fantastic. You. Hey, and thank you, Maria, Lisa, and Mike, for a terrific panel session. As a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. Following this session, the next session will begin at 4.30 p.m. in this keynote region, and it's entitled Staging Effective Graduate School Residencies in OpenSim VR, Methodologies and Insights. Also, we encourage you to visit the OSCC 20 Poster Expo 
in the OSCC Expo 3 region to find accompanying information on the presentations and to explore the hypergrid tour resources in OSCC Expo 2 region, along with the sponsor and the crowdfunder booths located throughout all of the OSCC Expo regions. Thank you again to our panelists and to the audience. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for having us. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, this is great.